Hey, just really quick before we get into today's episode, I wanted to let you know that I'm running a limited edition plush with Makeship, and this time it's Casper. So if you want to grab your own Casper plush, make sure you get him before he's gone. There's only like 19 days left. It is a limited run and he's not coming back. Make sure you go to makeship.com slash products slash Casper dash longboy dash plush, or just click the link in the description box. DNA test kits have a lot of benefits these days. Not only do you get to learn about your family history and where you come from, but you can also learn more about genetic diseases that you might be more at risk for. It helps consumers be aware and proactive about their health. And honestly, it's probably cheaper to grab a 23andMe kit than it is to get testing done through a healthcare provider. For some, just spitting into those little test tubes has actually changed lives. Laricia Buford, for example, never knew her father. Though her mother said that her dad had the last name Whitehead, even when she eventually met the man, they looked nothing alike. A DNA test confirmed they weren't actually related, leaving her without answers. However, thanks to a search angel, volunteers that help people find long lost relatives, she did find her biological father and now they're best friends. And she isn't the only one with a story of found family. Alice Collins told the Guardian that her father was switched at birth as a newborn. It was the only explanation as to why he wasn't at all related to his parents, despite their taking him home from the hospital. Eventually through the DNA results online, they actually found the person her father had switched with people have found their siblings, fathers, cousins, all thanks to these DNA tests literally bringing people together. Others have learned about their health and even their diet thanks to DNA testing, recommending which eating habits make the biggest difference for people with their genetics. Naturally, plenty of what these kits will tell you is pretty generic advice like avoiding fast food, but it can't hurt to hear, right? Plus it does feel nice to get advice custom tailored to your needs. Well, except when they can't actually back up their health advice with real scientific data. Isaac Cohane, a biomedical researcher at Harvard, says that there's little evidence small effects from genetic variations can be translated into dietary advice. He says, by and large, these tests are not giving a lot of value to the people who are purchasing them. He added that other factors play a far bigger role on health, such as how much we eat. On the other hand, some of the health advice they give us is applicable, and it doesn't seem like a DNA testing service should really be the one giving it in the first place. Dorothy Pomerantz explained to Stat News that the health news she received from 23andMe was one that she'd rather hear from a doctor. The DNA kit told her that she had a mutation in her gene called BRCA1, which put her at a large risk for breast and ovarian cancer. Her aunt died of breast cancer at a young age, so hearing this was especially devastating and traumatic for Dorothy. Now, this isn't to say that this wasn't important news to hear, but finding out online in a DNA report doesn't seem ideal either. When Dorothy confirmed the mutation with a genetic counselor, they were kind and sympathetic and asked what she needed at the moment. The counselor delivered the news in a way that 23andMe just didn't. Plus, as Dorothy explained, the test could lead to customers treating serious medical diagnoses as a parlor game. Though she went to a counselor to confirm her diagnosis, what about those who get a clean bill of health because 23andMe doesn't actually screen for all the variants of BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes? There are over a thousand variations that can elevate cancer risk after all, and 23andMe only screens for three. These three are the most common, but if someone tests negative, I have to wonder if these DNA kits can give someone a false sense of security. Or on the flip side, maybe they can needlessly terrify someone when they're incorrect. Of course, there's plenty of other issues with 23andMe, but maybe the privacy problems, data hoarding, and lack of transparency shouldn't be a surprise when the CEO has family connections to YouTube and Google. So, okay. So what if we stick to keeping genetic testing and health advice in a medical environment? Then these DNA tests are a good idea, right? Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati and today we're gonna be talking about DNA test kits. Whether it's 23andMe, Ancestry DNA, MyHeritage, Family Tree, or Living DNA, they all offer pretty much the same thing. You send them a vial of spit and they'll tell you everything there is to know about your DNA and genetics. On the surface, this seems pretty fun. Popular content creators have made videos about their DNA tests and it's become the norm to get one done at some point. However, the lack of privacy around these companies seems, at least in some companies, shady at least. But who wants DNA and genetic info so much in the first place? Well, the LDS church does apparently. 
a Mormon billionaire, James Sorensen, started one of the first genetic test kit companies called Relative Genetics, which was later bought by another Mormon company, Ancestry.com. They aren't owned by the LDS church, but the original buyers were Mormon. Now, this isn't to say that every single person interested in genetics out there is Mormon, but it is a very important aspect of their religion, apparently, so it's not surprising that yes, these ties exist. The Salt Lake Tribune wrote in 2013 that the Mormons genealogical database family search joined forces with ancestry.com to bring about a billion historical records online. Family search, which calls itself one of the largest genealogy organizations in the world is a boon to ancestry without a doubt. Nowhere but the LDS church will you find such a broad, vast database like this. However, the reason why they want your information feels a bit off. It's for something called proxy baptisms. Essentially, it's having a living person stand in place for a dead person so that the deceased can become baptized and become Mormon even after death. Now, it's one hell of an oversimplification, but it's in a decent part, at least, why the LDS church collects this data. Plus, given their relationship with ancestry, all LDS church members get free memberships. And according to Harvard Divinity School, quote, they can use their account to send relatives they find on ancestry.com directly to the LDS church for a proxy baptism with the click of a button. Does this mean that Ancestry.com is run by and owned by the Mormons? No, not necessarily. But I personally am uncomfortable with the relationship. Like the deceased can't consent to a baptism and some of them are done in extremely poor taste. Have we forgotten that the Mormons posthumously baptized Anne Frank? Because I didn't forget that. When Ancestry.com works with the LDS church, it feels like they're putting a stamp of approval on family search and what the church is using it for. I absolutely could be just overthinking this, but even so, the relationship makes me just a tad uncomfy. And maybe you don't have an issue with this though, and that's okay too. But let's take a look at who else wants to get a hold of your genetic information. Parabon Nanolabs is one of the most famous forensic genetics companies on the planet, according to Nature Magazine. They solve decades old cold cases by comparing suspects DNA to profiles on genealogy databases, piecing together family trees to track down alleged offenders. Basically, if you put your information on there while trying to learn where your ancestors come from, that could be used to put away one of your close relatives if they left their DNA behind on a crime scene. Again, that doesn't seem bad on the surface, maybe for the person, but maybe don't commit that crime, but it can be used for great things, for giving peace of mind to grieving families that were searching for answers for years. But then Parabon solved a case that seemingly wasn't cold. A teenage boy assaulted an elderly person in a Mormon meeting house in Utah. If the case were black and white, maybe it would make sense to call in Parabon. A teenager assaulted someone, they traced DNA from blood at the crime scene back to him and that's it. But there's a bit more to the story here. The main point of contention is that GED Match, the database that Parabon used, is only supposed to allow access when it's to solve a murder or sexual assault. This case actually fit neither of those descriptors, so they were breaking a privacy policy. It may have been for a good reason, but what else would they be willing to break it for? Genealogists, privacy experts, and the public at large were understandably a bit pissed off. Many people had their information on GED Match logged right on and opted out for law enforcement use. Even if this technology can be used for amazing things, that transparency and privacy is extremely crucial here. Plus, we all know what can happen here if the public forgave this. When you give an inch, they'll take a mile. Two things can be true at the same time. One, that teenage boy deserved to be caught and punished for beating up an elderly person. Two. Parabon should have never broken its disclaimer and used that database for anything other than sexual assault or murder. These privacy concerns have only gotten worse in recent years. Consumer Reports wrote a lengthy report about these problems, explaining that when you consent for your DNA to be used medically, it's important to know what that means. Sure, sometimes your information might end up in the hands of academic institutions. You'll be contributing to science with your genes. It's no wonder that more than 80% of 23andMe customers opt into this research. But what they may not know is opting in can also mean that your data can be used for internal research, AKA product development. Basically, you paid hundred dollars on a test kit for the company to use you to make their next kit all the better for their customers. It doesn't sound super fair, but I kind of get it. But as Consumer Reports explains, it really does toe the line between medical usage and corporate product development. Personally, I think that if the company themselves is using the data, then that would be a whole thing to opt into, but maybe that's just me. All right, now we know who wants your data and what they wanna do with it, but what do they do once they get it? Are these companies protecting your information so no one questionable can get their hands on it? Or is that a little bit more lax than you'd like to believe?
I was pleasantly surprised when I read that many of these DNA kit test sites are truly very protective of your DNA. Consumer Reports claimed that they worked with AppCensus, a privacy research company, to analyze what these DNA test companies are actually up to. Though they may not know what happens behind the scenes, CR said that protections for a person's DNA were, for the most part, relatively solid. And I know that the phrase relatively solid may not be the most comforting of terms, but it's not actually your DNA that you need to worry about with the DNA kit companies. Kind of odd, right? It's actually your non-DNA data. All that really interesting health information about genetic diseases you may be prone to, yeah, that can actually still be shared. And when you opt in, chances are that it absolutely will go to third parties. And while that doesn't necessarily mean something evil, it's pretty concerning how much data these companies collect and how widespread they actually share it. CR investigated five of them, by the way, and they were Circle DNA, Ancestry, 23andMe, Geno Palette, and MyHeritage. Only one of them, Circle DNA, had a reasonably accurate list of third parties that collect data about their users. That means the other four either don't know everyone they're sharing data with or simply don't care enough to tell their consumers. Is either a good look? Absolutely not. But perhaps you're still not concerned. I mean, even if they have your zip code and gender, it's not as if they could re-identify you. The thing is, that's really not all they have. With your phone number, email address, and name, it's really not that hard to figure out who someone is. A 2019 study published by Nature Communications found that almost every American can be re-identified from any data set with 15 demographic attributes. Our data gets shared all the time. And it seems like it's just a sad fact of life at this point that we really don't have much control over it whatsoever. I know that caring about your data being shared feels like a lost cause because there's no sense of recourse, but I also feel like it's different with DNA companies. And that's because you're giving them so much more than a phone number, but literally your genetics. You're giving them your health, ancestry, all of it. If these companies were open about who they share information with, then maybe it wouldn't seem so concerning. CR suggests that data kit companies should craft more limited research permissions and practice more transparency. On the flip side, consumers need to know that when you opt in, you're far more vulnerable to sensitive information being shared in places you may not agree with. Plus, no, HIPAA does not protect this kind of health information. And no matter what privacy policy a company has in place now, that's always subject to change. And speaking of change, it's worth mentioning that although CR says that DNA protection with the five companies they analyzed was strong, a couple of years ago, some claimed that that wasn't the case. PNAS or Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences cited a study from eLife that said it was the smaller companies, the ones competing with 23andMe and Ancestry that had these issues. Apparently the industry giants won't let users upload their own genetic data, but smaller ones allow new users to upload their own genotype data purchased from another service. Basically, if you've already got your 23andMe results, you might want to plug that information into GED match database and find more extended family. By using one of these smaller services, you can do so. It's just far riskier. Again, it feels like there's a lot of ways this personal sensitive information can fall into the wrong hands. Hackings can and have happened in the past. The FTC even opened an investigation into 23andMe to ensure that they were using the best data protection practices. It was closed, but lingering questions surround them, though more on 23andMe in just a moment. So now that we know who's interested in your genetic data, what they want to do with it and how they protect it, what about the accuracy of the information they give you in return? Earlier, I said that the genetic health advice they give is a bit laughable, but harmless. Sometimes they can't even provide valuable information about your cancer risk, even if it doesn't substitute for what a doctor or medical professional can provide. Unfortunately, some of the health information they provide doesn't fall into either of these categories and it's apparently downright false. A lawsuit against 23andMe alleges that their test results are meaningless and they use false advertising to promote their kits. They were also sent a warning letter from the FDA warning the company that their marketing materials, quote, violate federal law by making claims which have never been federally approved. The class action lawsuit and the FDA warning letter were both filed within a week of each other. So it seems like this was coming to a head for a while now. Now, there are obvious reasons as to why this is disgusting. MLMs lie about potential income. Shady businesses might lie about how useful their products actually are. But to lie about health is kind of next level for me. Plus, considering that it's a DNA kit company doing the lying, people may be more prone to believe them. 
And this is just my opinion, so feel free to take it or leave it, of course, but I feel like many customers are more prone to listening and believing what a DNA company tells them about their health because they have biological evidence to back it up. That's why it's so shitty for 23andMe to do this. And frankly, that's why I think the lawsuit should have sought more than $5 million. I know there's only so much that can be won here, even when tens of thousands of customers were entitled to damages, but penalizing them for this kind of lie just feels justified. Scientific American elaborated on the whole situation and said that while 23andMe is terrifying, it's not for the reasons the FDA thinks. According to their article, it's not the accuracy of the health advice that the DNA kits provide that's the real problem here. Instead, SA argues that 23andMe's personal genome service isn't meant to be a medical service at all, quote, It is a mechanism meant to be a front end for a massive information gathering operation against an unwitting public. In other words, 23andMe isn't just collecting and potentially oversharing data about you and your health, but their genome service exists solely for this purpose. Other companies have done this in the past. Google may have an incredible search engine that many of us rely on on a daily basis, but their fundamental purpose isn't helping a consumer search for the average length of spaghetti or possible ways to grow taller. It's information hoarding. Do I sound like I have a tinfoil hat on? Maybe. And you might be thinking, Blair, you can't possibly know the company's intentions. It's just a DNA service. And you're right. So then let's take a look at someone who does know the company's intentions. Patrick Chung, a 23andMe board member, he told Fast Company this. The long game here is not to make money selling kits, although the kits are essential to get base level data. Once you have the data, the company does actually become the Google of personalized healthcare. Just like Google doesn't actually care that much about helping you build a time machine or how to teach a penguin to fly or whatever weird things you're searching, 23andMe doesn't seem to care about telling you who your great, great, great grandmother is either. She's gone, but you're here and your data is valuable. And again, 23andMe may make promises around privacy, assuring customers that they'll always ask permission to use genetic info. Google has broken its promises around privacy protection too. So I'm just saying, promises don't mean too much in the corporate world. At the end of the day, if 23andMe actually wants to revolutionize healthcare and give people information that may help them prevent disease, then they need scientific data to back that up. Given their FDA warnings and lawsuit, I'm not sure I can trust them to do that. But as per usual, we're still not done here. We know how they collect and treat information, but there's one important aspect of DNA kits we still haven't touched upon. Are these kits actually getting the right information to begin with? And can they truly analyze anyone that uses them? And before we get into that, I'm just gonna take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. This holiday season, the best deal in wireless can only be found at Mint Mobile. Right now, when you switch to Mint Mobile and buy a three month plan, you'll get another three months for free. Or if you need a new device for a limited time, you'll get six months of free service when you select a device and plan together. As the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, Mint Mobile lets you order and activate from home with eSIM while saving tons on phone plans just starting at 15 bucks a month. I've been using Mint Mobile long before this holiday deal, about two years now, or a little over two years, I think. And I have to say, this is the perfect time to switch because this kind of deal is not here often. And as per usual, all plans are gonna come with unlimited talk and text, and it's also gonna offer high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. So switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. And again, for a limited time, you can buy any three-month Mint Mobile plan and you'll get three more months for free by going to mintmobile.com slash casket. That's mintmobile.com slash casket. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash casket. Function of Beauty is the world's first fully customizable hair care that creates individually filled shampoos, conditioners, styling, and treatment formulas based on your hair type. They offer over 54 trillion possible formulations, and each one is vegan and cruelty-free with no sulfates or parabens. And you can go completely silicone-free too. And it's super easy to get started. You take their hair quiz that's designed to build your hair profile, and you select up to five hair goals. If your hair gets frizzy in the winter, but oily in the summer, function formulations can be updated as often as you need to keep your hair on track at all times. After you get through your hair goals, you're gonna choose your color and fragrance, or you can go dye in fragrance free like I recently did. And I'm gonna be honest, it's just as lovely. Then after all of that quiz, you get your freshly filled formula delivered straight to your door and just prepare for good hair days ahead. So start giving your hair the personalized care it needs. Go to functionofbeauty.com slash casket to take your hair goals quiz and you'll save 20% on your first order when you subscribe. No commitments and you can cancel at any time. Go to functionofbeauty.com slash casket to let them know you heard it from our show and get 20% off your first order. Again, that's functionofbeauty.com slash casket to take your hair quiz and save 20% on your first order.
If 23andMe or any other DNA kit for that matter uses all their collective data to come to conclusions about their users, then it's important to recognize who their users are. For the most part, the people buying 23andMe are wealthy and white. Therefore, wealthy white folks are represented, but everyone else, not so much apparently. If you're any other predominant race, your results are seemingly less likely to be accurate and precise. Rana Mola told her story around this to Vox, claiming that even though she had Italian ancestry, 23andMe said she was Middle Eastern. Rani told her grandmother who insisted that no, Rani was Italian and the DNA kit was lying. About three years later, after her grandmother passed, Rani got an email from 23andMe that admitted to their mistake. She is a quarter Italian after all. And mistakes do happen. And if this was just one slip up, then I'd be more prone to give 23andMe the benefit of the doubt. However, this is apparently a consistent issue with DNA kits as almost 80% of 23andMe study participants are of European descent. 23andMe is perfectly aware that this is an issue with the CEO and Wojcicki stating that their products were Eurocentric and part of the problem. While it's not technically 23andMe's fault that the majority of their customers are white, it is their fault that they aren't making more of an attempt to lift up black and diverse voices. Not a single black employee was at the director level or above within the company at that time. Oh, and if Anne's last name sounds a little bit similar for some quirky reason you can't identify, she's the sister of CEO of YouTube, Susan Wojcicki, and she's married one of the co-founders of Google. So mildly terrifying considering what we spoke about earlier, but there's that connection that I mentioned at the beginning of the episode. Moving on though, Cunningham, co-founder and chief scientific officer of True Genomix posed the question, how can you foster trust with me as an African-American if I don't see any African-Americans on your team? Wojcicki admitted they were part of the problem and now it's their job to become part of the solution. They took a step that many companies don't by saying that they have issues and what happens next show how much they really do want to change. On the surface, it seems like 23andMe is trying to correct this with their Populations Collaborations program. They also announced the Global Genetics Project to give free tests to people who can trace all four grandparents to one of 61 underrepresented countries. So yes, 23andMe wants more data from more communities, but until they get it, they're going to continually fail anyone that isn't white at a higher rate than people who are. At the same time, how they collect data from underrepresented countries is also important. It is great to learn about other places through descendants. However, when people buy a DNA kit, they're making a choice. When 23andMe is going to countries to collect it, it feels a bit wrong knowing that they're going to use it for personal gain. Sarah Zong of The Atlantic explains it as such, when I sent the description of 23andMe's Populations Collaborations program to Janita DeVries, a biochemist at University of Cape Town who co-authored the H3 Africa guidelines, she flipped the scenario around. Imagine an African company gets African researchers to collect 1000 DNA samples of Americans just because they want to. People would not like that at all. Given how 23andMe has treated and potentially even exploited their willing customers, them going into African countries and asking for genetic data leaves a pretty bad taste in my mouth. It's upsetting that black people are unable to trace their ancestry in the same way that white people are. And ultimately 23andMe benefits from that. Helping underserved people in black communities learn about their history is better left to nonprofits and charities whose purpose is to do that, not for a for-profit that seemingly just wants to data hoard. So how does 23andMe fix things without being exploitative? Transparency, going above and beyond to be honest with their customers is gonna be a really big part of it. Being able to tell users exactly where their data may be used. Considering compensating people if you use and profit from their data. Recruiting people of color to participate is a good step forward, but not if it's exploitative and done in the shadows. With something as important as DNA and genetics, we need light on it. But while DNA kits may tell you everything about your ancestry, where they put your data is one thing they would rather keep hidden. But with all of that being said, that is where I'm going to end today's episode. And I hope you learned something new here today. Let me know if you've tried any of the DNA kits. I haven't. And after obviously doing all this research, I'm pretty happy I haven't participated. Thank you so much for joining me to the end of the episode. I do really appreciate it. Thank you for your time and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.